Games are wasting our time. And I don't mean that in the sense they aren't worth our time. I made a whole channel dedicated to them. I sure hope that isn't the case. I mean it in the sense that for as great as games are, almost no one's finishing them. But why is that? Why is it that amazing and lauded games like Doom, Grand Theft Auto, The Witcher, and Fallout New Vegas have so many people completing the first mission, but only a handful of survivors left at the end to see the credits in full. Well, first of all, people are lazy and almost no one finishes anything. But I also think part of the reason for this might be the fact that games just aren't respecting our time. Rather, they're wasting every precious second they have. And even more interestingly, it's not just the developer's fault, as easy as a scapegoat as that seems to be nowadays. Here's a recent comment I made on X about time in games that had a lot of backlash, but also shed some light on all of this. It's not about the time. It's about how amazing every second of that time is. $70 for a five hour game is perfectly fine if those five hours are sublime. If you were judging games purely on a price to time spent ratio, your time isn't very valuable to you in the first place. Go work hard until it is. Because you see, games shouldn't be about nothing more than the length of time they manage to confine us in front of a screen. And it's modern day gamers' propensity to rely on this metric so heavily, along with many other concerning recent trends propagated from this, that have diluted the core of what it is we should achieve with this medium in the first place. So today, I want to talk about why modern games are wasting so much of our time, and how to fix it. And what better way to start on this explanation than one of the biggest offenders out there? open worlds. I'll never forget the first time I walked out into the freezing cold valley of Whiterun in Skyrim and was in awe at the adventure before me. Or as a kid, when I left the sewers under the capital of Oblivion and was met with the roaring sounds of the limitless mountain ranges before me. These experiences defined my love for games growing up and eventually cascaded into me making videos nowadays. And that's because when an open world is done right, it can add so much to a game and its setting and help truly immerse you in the ambiance of it all. So much so that over the past decade, countless series have transitioned to being open world, trying to recapture the magic and garner more sales. But sadly, it's one of the best examples of a plague that has swept this industry as of late, where instead of focusing on quality, we are stuck thinking about quantity. Because the thing is, I don't think most developers are making open worlds because it actually is making games better. In fact, for the large majority of cases, if anything, it makes them much, much worse. Structured and meaningful missions with direct narratives are substituted instead for soulless and meandering side and fetch quests that serve no purpose but to give you something to do. Hyper-detailed and fascinating environments full of lore are traded in for boring sections of walking across digitized rocks with no environmental storytelling to boot. And at every turn, beautiful, thought-provoking game design is given up on in favor of incoherent mechanics that are all made with the single intention of padding game time. When you have worlds and universes that are so large in scope, they also put a greater demand on the narrative and design teams. And you know, I'll never understand how people will play such a short game like Journey or Titanfall and absolutely love it, but refund it because it only lasted them a couple of hours, yet spend hundreds of hours in a game like Assassin's Creed or Far Cry only to complain about how they didn't like any of it. Just because a game is longer doesn't mean it's more worth your money or your time. And in fact, I would argue that in most cases, a shorter game is actually better. Take for example a beloved title like Elden Ring, one of the best releases of the past decade, and a game that quite literally made FromSoft a household name and juggernaut in the industry. For as much as I adore Elden Ring, for as amazing as so many of the bosses and environments are, the game is just too long. I mean seriously, I can't tell you the amount of people I know personally that love the game, but when they got to the snowy mountaintops in the north and realized they had an entire normal game's worth of playtime left to finish, they just bailed. And that's not because the game was too long inherently, but because it didn't justify its length. 
The narrative itself lost so much pacing and intensity because of the fact that it took so long to do anything. And because the stakes didn't seem to grow exponentially with time, long stretches felt slow and less interesting than they could have otherwise been. And when you keep seeing the same bosses over and over again for many dungeons all over the world for instance, you eventually start to ask yourself the question, why? Why did we need another dungeon with the scary cat statue thing at the end for me to kill? Why are the interiors to all of the side dungeons exactly the same? Why is the underground zone I discovered in the woods the exact same one that I discovered under a library? Because even when things like this are offset by rewards that vary and allow new character builds or new sets of lore to untangle, it still gives off a weird impression that the developers behind the game simply don't respect our time. When I was playing Elden Ring, my emotions were always a mixture of pure bliss from finding new places or vanquishing new bosses, and frustration of finding so many copy-pasted enemies and areas in order to fill a world of such breathtaking scale. And while I spent over 100 hours with the game, at least 25 of those were doing things I wasn't particularly excited or interested in, but rather just random places on the map I figured I should go to since they're there and I wanted to cross them off a list. Why was an entire 25 hours, almost one fourth of my full time spent with this game, I even adore so much, like this? Well, it's because this plague nowadays of trying to make games so long is actually just making them spend more time wasting ours. I personally think Elden Ring would have been much better if they instead reduced the amount of content they had by 20 to 40% and just really focused on making the existing stuff all unique and interesting. Kind of like Dark Souls, the whole thing that made them popular in the first place. Because while grandness and scale in games is very impressive and I do like it personally, it may even be the thing that made Elden Ring more popular than Dark Souls, what I like even more is not having to deal with all the bullshit to get to the actually fun or engaging things. It's like you took a 10 out of 10 game and mixed it with a 5 out of 10 one, where things are just tedious for tedium's sake, all in an effort to hit this arbitrary need set forth by gamers to fill out games with as much content and things to do as possible just to justify a purchase. For every amazing encounter like the Red Giant of the North, there are five similar bosses or trash mobs I have to sift my way through to even get there. To me, it's the antithesis of what games should be, and somewhere in the last couple of years and decades, we lost the plot and decided that games need all these filler sections and content for some reason. For as much as something like Call of Duty takes a lot of flack, a lot of the original campaigns for Black Ops, Modern Warfare, and World at War were so amazing because they had none of this annoying half-baked content to get through. Each mission was short, sweet, and to the point, and because of that, it was actually so much more fun. And even though that meant the campaigns were really quick, it also meant I didn't have to deal with things like this constantly. Stumbling upon a map where I have no idea what to do next, and all of it is trash. In fact, another game that suffered from this syndrome even more, to the extent that it quite literally ruined the entire package, is Starfield. A game with literally hundreds of hours of content to the point where you could play for weeks on end and still not see everything it has to offer. And that sounds great, right? For only $70, you were getting dozens of games worth of content to explore and fall in love with. Wrong. Because in order to achieve this level of scale, Bethesda had to cut back on so much. In Starfield, there are systems for crafting, building outposts, building ships, sneaking, trade and commerce, dialogue pickpocketing, faction reputations, zero-g combat, space combat, ground combat, melee weapons, laser weapons, ballistic weapons, and so on and so on. But the thing is, none of it is amazing. And I really do mean it when I say the word amazing. If you are a developer right now making a game and any single feature you have isn't that, then cut back on everything you can until the smallest of features you have are. 
Because in a game like Starfield, the crafting and building is worse than their previous game, Fallout 4. The dialogue is laughably bad to the point where it completely takes you out of the experience. And sneaking and pickpocketing is so janky that entire missions that revolve around it become a chore to even try because of all of the issues. The whole reason games like Dishonored and Prey are so beloved, for example, is because they have a singular focus and idea of what they wanted to do, and they did it in an exhilarating fashion. Every section of the space station or a city in Prey and Dishonored is playtested and designed with the most precision possible, so that players can take on each objective in literally five to 10 different ways. In Starfield, when you infiltrate a bandit hideout, you just shoot stuff, and that stuff always looks the same with the same lockers, same armor, and same exact layouts of every single base on every single planet. Open worlds as a whole right now focus so much on being nothing more than a great value proposition that they become devoid of the character and dedication to features that define all amazing games we love. And even if we do get, say, 5 to 20 hours of amazing story quests out of a huge game like Starfield and Elden Ring, why not just make a game solely focused on that stuff? Would you rather spend 20 hours grinding through okay content in order to get to the really good stuff for five hours and repeat? Or just play a game for five or 10 hours that never isn't fun? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, play Titanfall 2, where not a single moment is wasted or not fun. And anything that didn't serve that purpose was cut, resulting in a campaign that can be beat in an afternoon before dinner. But that's also not to say that games need to be quick. Sometimes the slower and more thoughtful moments are what make a series great too. And as I mentioned before, there are open worlds like Skyrim that are built on this idea from the ground up and do work. However, Skyrim only works so well because each corner of its map is unique and interesting, with gameplay and design flow that is at its best when you're just wandering around aimlessly. A game that was built to be an open world because it suited what it was trying to do so perfectly, not because it would make the game last longer and convince people it was more worth the money. Basically what I'm getting at is, as weird as it sounds, we as gamers need to start expecting less, but also more. We can't look forward to every game being massive with enormous amounts of content, and we shouldn't be so hyper-focused on those being the ones we're most hyped about. But what we can do is spend our valuable time only on the titles that make every single hour count. Almost no developers in the world right now can make games over 100 hours long that for the entire runtime are nothing but pure bliss. And if we're being realistic, something like that is probably impossible most of the time. Not everyone can be Larian and make Baldur's Gate 3. But what they can make is that same level of quality we see from games like that at a smaller scale and work from there. And by the way, that goes for some massive AAA studios as well that just haven't figured out how to make quality at that scale yet. It's okay for a massive AAA studio to make a 10 hour game and sell it for 70 or even $80. That's perfectly fine as long as the content is worth it. If anything, we should be begging for far shorter but super high quality experiences that we'll never forget. 5-10 to 10 hour games where every single second you have a controller or mouse in your hand is one that has the most amount of effort put into it as possible. We should be demanding quality, not quantity. Because the thing is, as much as people don't want to admit it, often these two things don't really fit together. And you can't just ask for both. And that's due to a little thing called pacing. In my opinion, pacing might just be the most important part of games that barely anyone's talking about. It's the secret formula behind why certain single player games are so much better than others, why specific MMOs garner such a lasting reputation and others die, and why competitive games focus so much on matchmaking algorithms to keep you playing. Because at the heart of all games and why we play them is a sense of fun or challenge. If you aren't being challenged or you aren't having fun, there are very few things that will keep you engaged for long. And the best way to actually accomplish either of these states is to have a strong and demanding grasp over the pacing of a title. No matter how good a game's narrative and story are, no matter how fun the gameplay around it is, without good pacing, they all fall so flat. For example, one of my favorite games of the past few 
few years. Hi-Fi Rush is in part so great because of immaculate pacing. Levels are usually fairly short and to the point, enemy variety and music changes constantly early on, and the frequent intermingling of gameplay and high quality animation mixed with lovable and humorous characters makes it so almost every moment in the game is a joy to play. But keep in mind I said almost every moment. Because there is one mission in Hi-Fi Rush, Track 5 Breaking Out, which almost entirely spoils the fun. In the missions prior, it felt like everything was constantly changing and staying fresh, with fights inside volcanoes trying to deplete a boss's budget to fight, and running across skyscrapers or discovering talking and flying robotic cats with adorable smiles. But in Track 5, it feels like everything comes to a halt. Suddenly, for over 40 minutes, you must suffer through endless corridor after corridor corridor, trying to ascend a massive superstructure, with the same enemies over and over again in the same exact looking arenas. For the first five minutes of this encounter, it is novel and interesting, but quickly this novelty transcends into pure boredom that the game simply didn't have before. And this is mainly due to the fact that the level just has really poor pacing. As opposed to almost every other track in the game, track 5 really feels like a filler or side quest in an otherwise awesome main ensemble, almost like an opening act for the main band about to play on stage. And it's crazy too because after this the levels become a lot more fun and engaging, and especially the final three tracks of this game are nothing but pure bliss and high adrenaline feel good moments that make it all worth it. But it makes us beg the question, why is track 5 Five, even in the game in the first place. Sure, it serves as a set point between story moments, but why was it dragged out for so long? They simply could have cut down this segment to a quick 10 minute section between levels, but instead, because of the developer's desire to either pad game length or include something that wasn't perfectly polished yet, it hurts the whole package. And the reason I'm being so harsh on Hi-Fi here is because I love the game. It perfectly encapsulates in most ways everything I'm talking about here, especially those final levels that don't spend a second not doing something amazing, and you can feel the love and passion poured into those levels specifically. But even a great title like this suffers from the plague of pacing that all games seem to have nowadays, where for some reason, rather than cutting content that isn't perfect or refined, developers keep it in since so much work was already done. But remember, games aren't here to show off your work, they're here to entertain, and if you want to entertain well, don't put anything but 10 out of 10 content content in your game, in my opinion. In books and movies, for example, things like this are usually instantly cut, and for good reason. And I think it's time that games finally start taking up a similar mantra, where quality always trumps quantity no exception. You know, a lot of you might remember from back in school going over diagrams like this of three-act structures or Freytag's pyramid for instance. All formulaic ways of structuring a story or narrative, that way it can keep the audience entertained the entire way through. Focusing on things like the introduction, rising action, climax, return or fall, and finally, great catastrophe. But through any of these diagrams and whatever the sections are called, the main goal of each is to maintain great pacing, structures to craft great stories through both ups and downs, and creating narratives that almost feel like a bout with bipolar disorder, constantly throwing you from one emotion to the next. And these structures are so well known for a reason, they work. And more importantly, if a story or even gameplay itself doesn't have a flow at least resembling this, well, well you have a boring game on your hands. And related to this, I was listening to a recent video from one of the greatest game developers of all time, Tim Kaine, and he talked about how important pacing is in games. An analogy he used was when you were making a game, you almost want to structure it like a roller coaster as opposed to a monorail, meaning you need to have tons of points of build up and tension followed by massive and exciting releases. It's what keeps people playing and interested in any title, and in order to craft an amazing game, you need to have this in both story and gameplay. And an ideal example of this is a small indie game called Fear 
Fury, which sadly never got the love and recognition it deserves. Because in Fury, the entire game is nothing more than one boss after another, but in between each of these heroic fights, you must slowly walk your way through new and beautiful areas to the backdrop of one of the best game soundtracks of all time. And it's this dichotomy of intense and tough bosses versus idyllic and slow walking in between that superbly captures the essence of these narrative structures that books and movies use all the time. In fact, in Fury, even the story itself and the twists presented near the end are built up so perfectly throughout. Because at the end of Fury, it's revealed that the entire time you've been playing the game, spoiler alert by the way, you were actually the bad guy. But upon looking back on your actions throughout the entire playthrough, it becomes obvious this was the case, and it makes the reveal even better because it was right in front of your eyes the whole time. An immaculate buildup to a roaring climax right at the end. And really more than anything, Fury just shows how great a game can be purely because of how it paces itself with such intention. Another great example of the opposite side of this would be another game that I do love, Pacific Drive, where if you happen to die on any of your treacherous adventures out in the wildlife with your rusty jalopy car by your side, you lose everything you did on that run, and now return to your home base with tons of repairs to do and way behind where you were before. As much as I love the difficulty in this game and adore the challenges in overcoming them, the real problem with this title is actually the pacing. Because even though some of these hard stops create some of the best stories I've had in a game in a while, they aren't backed up by a narrative or gameplay pacing that justifies them. And that means anytime you make a mistake in the game, it feels really bad, not because it was hard, but because the momentum of the story and gameplay alike come to a screeching halt, with likely an hour of gameplay in between you and returning to that momentum again. And funnily enough, in games, pacing like this can actually vary so so much from player to player. One person might finish the game never dying at all and find the narrative to be perfectly paced but the gameplay too easy, while another might die over and over again and love the pacing of the gameplay, slowly getting more and more difficult but find the story so lacking because it barely ever happens. And it shows why pacing can actually be so hard to perfect. Because unlike a movie or book where the author has almost full control over how you experience it, in game, we're in the driver's seat. And that means not only do developers have to craft stories and design gameplay segments that are good when being played as intended, but they need to be good even when being played well outside the bounds of expectation. And thinking about it this way, I would argue that actually is why Baldur's Gate 3 had such a huge blow up in the first place, even in such a niche genre. Because no matter what you do in that game, Every time you try something, there is a believable, and even more importantly, well-paced reaction to you, where it feels like not only is the story and world truly your own playground, but it is all one that stays interesting throughout. Another perfect example of problems with pacing in games too is Inscription, yet another game I highly recommend to anyone who hasn't tried it, one of my other favorites ever. The first act of three in this wholly unique title is far and away its best, and also the portion of the game that most people fall in love with and rave so much about. And the reason for this is that the first act of inscription is not only completely new and fascinating, with one of the best twists in gaming history, but also the card game and its mechanics in this section are far and away the most captivating in the whole game, with constant new cards you are finding, endless strategies to uncover, and an entire world outside of the main game to peel back the layers to. The pacing in this first act in many ways is perfect. There is always something new to try out mechanically, or a small tidbit of lore or discovery that completely turns a story and world on its head. And because of this, playing through this first section feels so fun. You really want to keep pushing forward to learn more, to unlock every card to see what's possible, and it truly just makes it hard to put this title down. However, once you get past this first section, which I'm being vague about on purpose as to not spoil one of the best games of all time for you guys, you are then met with the final two acts, which while in their own own right or fun, 
aren't nearly as well paced. Constant progression and deep intrigue are swapped out for periodic upgrades with a narrative that seems a lot more predictable. And suddenly the game you absolutely could not stop playing and adored becomes the type of experience you take breaks from and come back to later to finish. Keeping that non-stop dopamine, adrenaline, or serotonin mixture in our brains while playing is so key to keeping us engaged. And this all comes down to pacing. Even though the basic mechanics of a card game and description stay similar throughout the entire runtime, only in Act 1 does the pacing and challenge and reward alike culminate in something truly legendary. But I want to clarify, that doesn't mean every single game needs to be fast-paced like Hi-Fi Rush or Inscription's opening act to justify spending time with them. Other titles too, like Mass Effect or Red Dead Redemption, relish in the slower and more contemplative moments. Like how in Mass Effect 1, the whole second and third hours of playtime are nothing more than walking around a massive space station and talking to people. Or in Red Dead 2, the opening of the title being one of the most slow-paced and boring snow levels of all time that even made me almost quit. These moments, while slow, served as amazing points to truly get lost in the worlds on offer. And for Mass Effect specifically, the entire reason I love the series so much to this day is because of how swept up in the universe and the citadel I got originally, spending hours just talking to new alien races and learning about their cultures and politics. Because the thing is, even in moments like this that are so meandering and leisurely, they at least serve a purpose, either in immersing you into a setting or crafting a narrative that really hits home because of the buildup. The real issue with pacing isn't a matter of being fast versus slow or bombastic versus reflective. Games can be any mix of these and still not waste our time. After all, sometimes simply getting to know a character can be even better than fighting alongside them. It all depends on our mood and our desires as a player at the time. The actual problem, in my opinion, is something that on the contrary is always bad. Filler content. To me, filler content in games are any side quests, activities, or tasks whose primary goal is not in service to the main themes or goals of the actual narrative and gameplay. Things like destroying bandit camps just to add more gameplay to the world, delivery missions to pad out game time, or finding hidden treasure that does nothing but complete an in-game achievement. And to me, content like this is such an issue because it lies at the antithesis of what actually good games should be doing. Instead of crafting truly meaningful content for us to sink our teeth into, often developers nowadays, primarily due to the demands of many gamers, will add seemingly senseless tasks to do just to make a game feel long or grand. For example, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, quite literally a third of the entire game is doing nothing but tedious and laborious things, like swimming deep underwater to find a chest with just a little bit of gold in it, or clearing endless camp after camp of enemies, all with the exact same gameplay loop. And by the 10th time you've climbed a similar tower or rock formation to unlock a view of a larger area, you really have to sit back and wonder whether what you're doing is even worth it. The saddest thing about it all though, is that if we took all of this out of the game, there's actually a pretty cool main story with some really top tier moments and reveals that make everything so exciting. But to even get to that, you have to suffer through endless filler content that doesn't seem to have any love or care put into it. And this problem is permeated through throughout the games industry in all genre of games, otherwise amazing experiences marred down by a struggle to even get to the good stuff. Why are we okay with this? What is the point of pointless content? I've seen some pushback to games doing this as of late, but if anything, there should be even more. Why are we getting happy or excited when we hear a game is over 60 hours long with tons of things to do? That sounds horrible to me, because it sounds like a lot of, you guessed it, filler content. The whole reason I get so much more excited for shorter games nowadays is because that lack of length also comes with an assumption of focus on quality over quantity, meaningful content over sad and depressing filler. Because at the end of the day, the worst thing a game can do isn't be too hard, too easy, too short, too long, too safe, or too controversial. The worst thing a game can do is bore us. And what better way to do that than make a significant part of your experience 
content that isn't of the utmost quality. And you know, I've seen a lot of people under my previous videos ask why I usually only make reviews or discussions on games I like, and why I don't do more critiques of things I don't. And do you want to know the reason why? Because when a game starts to waste my time or bore me, I stop. I don't keep playing just because I spent a ton of money getting the special edition. I don't keep clearing every bandit camp or doing every half-assed side quest just because it's there. If the large majority of a game isn't something I thoroughly enjoy, something that obviously has a lot of love and care put into it, I just put the game down and I almost never come back. And while that means I don't get enough context and playtime to put out so many full reviews I otherwise could have, it does mean I maintain such a high level of passion and love for this industry, because I value my time and only let the absolute best games use it. And it goes back to the reason in large part that I usually like shorter or medium sized games, because they do away with all of the filler and instead add things that keep me more engaged. And if a game is longer, it needs to have a really good reason to justify it, whether that be a narrative that never loses steam, or a gameplay or crafting loop that is endlessly addicting and fun even hundreds of hours in, like say a lot of roguelites like Hades. Another great example is The Witcher 3, where even though I think the game's main narrative does drag on for far too long, because of the exceptional quality of the side quests throughout, spending even hundreds of hours in this world can be rewarding because of going off the beaten path to do totally unrelated tasks is something that's actually engaging and interesting. Or in other words, the world and its expansive nature is actually justified, not just eye candy and a catchy headline to attract sales about a big new open world. Even something like traveling slowly in a boat across the sea or a huge river, while technically boring in The Witcher, serves the purpose of downtime between action sequences or making the world feel more immersive and hits that three act structure we talked about before. In other games of similar style like Assassin's Creed, using a boat across the water feels more like a cheap party trick to try and fill out a huge space with something to do that isn't worth the effort. But this principle isn't only evident in filler content. It also carries over to many of the more predatory tactics we see nowadays, like loot boxes and microtransactions. And as if this video wasn't controversial enough, I actually don't mind microtransactions, loot boxes, or live service games at all. I think developers getting as much money as possible to pay their employees and make more games, which by the way are more expensive than ever, is completely fine. Even in a single player game like Dragon's Dogma 2, get your money. If people want to pay for things that don't give them extra power or, like Dragon's Dogma, the issue of extra saves, then I'm all for it. I'd rather the developers get as much money as possible and make the best damn games they can. It's not my money, not my problem. And as long as players aren't being forced to pay or there is no competitive advantage to doing so, losing all your cash to silly services like this sounds like a personal problem, not a societal or games industry one to solve. And spoken from someone who has spent thousands of dollars over a lifetime on pointless skins or cosmetics and games that I forget about the next day, guess what? That's my fault. That's a decision I made. Tough. My problem. I don't have sympathy for others who do it, and you shouldn't have sympathy for me. That's what life is. A bunch of hard lessons. And also, if anything, I'm glad they got my money. More to help the business I obviously enjoyed grow. But going back on topic, the thing about these systems is, while in principle, I actually think they are a net positive, allowing many more kids nowadays to play games for free or developers getting more money to fund bigger projects, they also can lead to more lazy and less interesting game design in some cases, similar to the problem with filler content. And that's because microtransactions allow developers to keep players engaged with rush dopamine hits and gambling addictions, rather than actually good writing, gameplay systems, or world building. For example, I love playing CSGO. I think the gunplay is tight and fast paced, I love the map layouts, and the community is a lot nicer than some other games. But sometimes when I play, I can't help but shake the feeling that the game could be so much more. More maps, more risk taking and mechanical changes, or just overall more of a feeling of effort being put into the product. And I get it in a sense. CS is such a staple at this point that it can be hard to change. But when I then look at a newer title like Valorant, 
I can't help but feel that Valve is just being lazy. And that's in large part due to the fact that for many people, CS is now less of a game and more of a slot machine. Streamers and players alike often will spend more time opening skin packs than actually playing the game, filling Valve's pockets with endless amounts of cash every day. Which in turn means actually improving the game and making meaningful updates constantly becomes less of a priority than making sure people pay. And because these methods are so effective at taking control of our animalistic brains, it means we end up spending even more time and money on something that isn't as fulfilling. But again, know whose fault that is? Ours. No one is being forced to play these live service games full of microtransactions or loot boxes, and the only way to stop this cycle is to actually start respecting your own time more. And at the end of the day, the real key point I'm getting at here is that games need to focus on having purpose. Because relentless purpose in all bits of content in any title is what makes those titles good. The idea of filler or less than stellar content shouldn't even be a consideration ever in my opinion. And I'm not sure why we're even okay with the idea of this being so ubiquitous in games to begin with. Because if you really think back to all of your favorite moments in a game you love, they're never all the careless and uninspired side content or menial tasks that serve no deeper purpose. It's those big and glorious boss fights that were planned out, the slower emotional moments with characters, or adrenaline pumping action that doesn't let up. These are the things that games should really be focused on harnessing. And in total truth, in the large majority of cases, that means much shorter experiences, with so much less bloat or systems that are just meant to add time or a cool slogan for marketing. But at the end of the day, the moral of everything I'm talking about here is remember, time matters. Out of all of the assets in this world, the money, the fame, or the admiration of others, nothing is more important than our time. Because it's our limited amount of time and how we choose to spend it that defines not only the person we become, but the way in which we view the world and how it views us. And if you were spending even small amounts of your precious moments on this earth doing something that could otherwise be spent better, you're doing it wrong. That doesn't mean being productive at all times or never taking a break. It means when you are taking those breaks, you are using them to take in art that is actually worth experiencing, not just mindless things whose only goal is to sap your time and energy with no good fun or emotional output on the other end. And in the realm of video games, this means playing the best of the best and not being afraid to stop playing a game that doesn't meet those standards for even a moment even if that means being out a hefty sum of money. Because while it can feel like all modern games are misusing your time, maybe the real culprit is the person you're looking back at in the mirror every day. The reason so many people aren't finishing games nowadays is because so many aren't worth finishing at all. Focus on playing games that relish in every moment they have rather than simply keeping you for as long as possible. And only by demanding that can things really get better in this industry. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to check out all of my other social media account links in the description below if you want to support me even more or consider subscribing to the membership program here on YouTube if you want to help me pay for more people to work on the channel. Thanks again and until next time.